Is a basic income better than welfare? I'm Adam Bearn and this is Scholars Mate. <laughs> And welcome to Scholars Mate. I'm your host, Adam Bearn. The idea of a universal basic income, also known as a basic income guarantee, is gaining traction in policy circles. Here's an explanation from the RSA, a British think tank. Nothing undermines life more than insecurity, but for too many, the last few decades have become ever more insecure. Work is less certain and more stressful especially for those in average incomes and lower. And we have a tax and benefit system that is complex and sometimes punitive. We could do something completely different, like give a basic monthly payment to every single citizen. This is called a basic income. It's a centuries old idea favored by philosophers, social reformers, civic leaders from across the political spectrum. And it could help us meet our needs today. Basic income would provide a platform to smooth the life transitions millions of us will face in the coming years, including changes that may come from technology. It's the best insurance policy there is. So would a basic income be a viable replacement for the current welfare system? Joining us to discuss the issue via Skype is Brian Kaplan, a senior scholar at the Mercatus Centre and a professor of economics at George Mason University. He is the author of The Myth of the Rational Voter and Selfish Reasons to Have More Kids. He writes Econ Log, named by the Wall Street Journal as a top economics blog. He received his PhD in economics from Princeton University and his BA in economics from the University of California at Berkeley. And also joining us via Skype is Carl Widerquist, Associate Professor at the Georgetown School of Foreign Service at Qatar. He holds a doctorate in political theory from Oxford University and another in economics from the City University of New York. He is the author of Independence, Propertylessness and Basic Income and co-editor of Basic Income, an Anthology of Contemporary Research and The Ethics and Economics of the Basic Income Guarantee. He was a founding editor of the journal Basic Income Studies. Gentlemen, thank you for joining us. Thanks for having us. So, Carl Widerquist, could you explain why a basic income would be an improvement to our current welfare system? Um, certainly. Uh, it is really the only system that can completely eliminate poverty. We should not have a world with poverty. And what we do when we, make, when we have poverty, it happens because some of us get access to resources and some of us don't. And I think it's wrong for any of us to deny people access to the resources they need to survive. And I think it's wrong for anybody to put conditions or make any judgment on someone else's access to the resources that they need to survive. Once the resources of the earth were available to everyone, we didn't necessarily live well then, but none of us were homeless, none of us were poor, none of us were, none of us were poor in this sense of not being able to access goods and resources uh, none of us were destitute. And we need to start with that system. Income, when, with basic income, all it means is that income doesn't start at zero. It starts at some level where nobody's destitute, so none of us ever has to fear poverty. But as your income goes up, you make more money, so we all have a material incentive to make more if we can and if good jobs are out there. And Brian Kaplan, how do you respond to Professor Widerquist's argument? So first of all, the idea that everyone is entitled to be supported, whether or not they work, whether or not they're able, just seems ridiculous to me. I mean, it's one thing to say that someone who is totally unable to take care of himself deserves to get some help from the government, but to say that absolutely everybody deserves it when most people are perfectly able to take care of themselves seems you know, very, very, very odd. Now, furthermore, if we do take care of everybody, the cost is likely to be exorbitant. Of course, it does depend upon how much this minimum income is and how quickly you take it away when people do earn income. But right now, we save an enormous amount of money by not giving money to people who don't need it. Right now, the welfare state is already very expensive. We start handing out money to absolutely everyone, whether they need it or not. The cost is going to be very high, and that means you're going to have to have really high taxes in order to pay for it. 
Uh, people who advocate the universal basic income often talk about how it's going to get better incentives. Uh, again, it may get better incentives for people who are already on welfare, but it's giving worse incentives to all the people who currently are not eligible. And it's also giving worse incentives to everybody who actually has to pay for it. So overall, to me, it seems like it is much worse than the system that we have right now. Okay, Professor Widerquist, you heard that argument that this would simply be too expensive. I don't think you mentioned exactly how much money you see each person getting in this basic income system. Uh, the federal poverty level is right now at, a, at uh, last I checked, was $11,770 for a single person. Mm -hmm. And then for a family, it goes down actually very quickly. So. Uh, at least that amount, so 12000 for an adult, 6000 for a child, or something like that. I'd actually like to see more, um, uh, pay perhaps 15000 for an adult. I mean, have you done the math on that? From I mean, Everyone that I've read says that would be incredibly expensive. Well, okay, you actually, you made three points. You, you made three points um, in your opening that I haven't had a chance to respond to. So maybe I should... Um, go through all of those. First of all, that you, you didn't think people were entitled to this, except for these people that you judge to be truly needy. Well, I, think, I think the government is really bad at judging who deserves what. And you gotta remember that, um, that the way we got property is that governments went around imposing duties on people. And they've imposed these things called property rights and they've given them to privileged people and then the privileged people trade them. And then some people really never get very far in that trade, and they're always without. And so this they've never agreed to have property rights, have this property rights system. And uh, so they're just left with no access to resources except by going to someone who owns those resources and saying, oh, may I work for you, or may, will you give me charity? That makes them a beggar, just because the government has created these things called property rights and, and turned our resources into property. So what you're doing when you own property and you pay for it, you're, you're paying for a basic income, is you're paying for the resources you hold, and then you receive back a basic income for the resources you don't hold. And that's one reason why everybody gets it. The uh, uh, wealthy people own a lot of stuff, so they're paying a lot of taxes, but they're also getting a basic income for all those other things that they don't own. So Brian Kaplan, government determining property, the argument is, is a well-established norm. So why shouldn't the government make it much simpler by just saying everyone can have this cash rather than just some people? Yeah, you know, I think you know, Carl has a bizarre view of the world where things are all, you know, where, where you know, property just exists and then people arbitrarily claim it. That's not the way that it normally works. Property gets produced by people. Poor people are not people who just had you know, you know, missed out on the great giveaway. They're people who generally have not produced very much. Rich people are generally those who produce a lot. So, and again, it's very odd to think about there being something non-consensual about this. What could be more non-consensual than your minding your business, doing your job, and then a stranger comes along and demands to get a share of the amount of, of, of what you produced? And I'd say it's the welfare state that's, that's non-consensual and that needs to be justified. Again, the idea that government is really bad at deciding who deserves things, I think there's a lot to that, but I'd say the main thing the government does is bend over backwards to say that people who haven't done anything still deserve to receive help. So, Brian Kaplan, what about the argument that if you strip away the current welfare system, you strip away all of those layers of bureaucracy that are involved in implementing it, and therefore that would make this proposal, a basic income, much more affordable? Right, so you have to look, to look at the actual numbers. The amount of money the government spends on bureaucracy is actually quite small compared to the amount of money that they hand out. Right, so you know, for Social Security, probably only about one or two percent of Social Security goes to administration. Almost all of it is cash. So it's you know, you say that you know the bureaucracy is actually one of the cheapest parts, and it's a part that actually serves a useful function, which is trying to make sure that we're not wasting a whole lot of money on people who really don't need it. Let me put it this way: If you were running a private charity, would you just go and hand out money to everybody? You know, of course not. You would go and try to figure out who actually needs the money. Who's, you know, who actually deserves the money? Who are the people who really are in trouble through no fault of their own? And you target the money that you have on them. So Carl Widerquist, how do you address that? Surely there will be people 
under this system that would just choose not to work because they're getting their $12,000 a year or whatever the sum is that you propose? Well, you gotta remember that we have an incentive problem right now. And the great thing about uh, basic income is it addresses that incentive problem. We have, uh, we have employers that don't have an incentive to pay good wages. So Brian Kaplan, I guess Professor Widerquist's argument is that this basic income would almost be like a strike fund. You could rely on that rather than having to take one of these low wage jobs and hold out until you can get something better from your employer. So isn't that a good thing? Uh, no, I don't see why. So why is the stranger should, should give you money so that you can be very choosy about what job you take? And again, so you know, you know, you know, the idea that an employer just is handed a business, you know, you know, people actually have to build these businesses. They don't come from nowhere, right? Uh, so, you know, I'm, I'm going, you know, and again, it seems to me that Carl is really just dodging the real question of isn't production going to fall a lot because a lot, a lot far fewer people want to work? And the answer is yes. So, I mean, I think it's, tr it's true that, um, that, uh, that uh, employers will have a stronger incentive in order to pay higher wages uh, in Carl's regime. But you know, a big effect of that is that a lot of them will decide they don't feel like doing it anymore because the workers' productivity isn't high enough. So they'll say, fine, in that case, I'll do without you. When the, in which case, it's just going to be taxpayers who will be on the hook for supporting all the people who are no longer working. So Brian, if we, t if we take away the, the arguments that Professor Widerquist is making just for a moment and say that the personal freedom is down to, you're talking about people who don't want to work. Well, what about, say, a single mother who has to work three jobs all day long to make ends meet. She's not being lazy, but mm -hmm. if she had a basic income, perhaps she should get she could give up those two other jobs, work one job, and have enough time to see her family, and also free up two other jobs for some, some someone else who needs it. Yeah, so I I disagree with that much less. Again, but the whole idea of this universal basic income is to give money to absolutely everyone, whether working three jobs, two jobs, one jobs, or zero jobs. Whether or not their problem is they're not working because they can't find a job, or if they're drunk, or if they just don't feel like it. Right? Uh, so you know, the whole the whole thrust of Carl's argument is saying let's not ask questions, let's not worry about this. And I say, look, if government's going to be spending money helping people, it should ask these questions. It's important because. It's, you know, it's not fair to people who are actually paying the taxes just to go and take their money to, to hand it out to everybody no matter what they've done. And Carl, surely that's an appropriate argument because, I mean, if you want to write me a check for $12,000 right now, I will happily take it. But ultimately, I don't really need it. So surely those dollars should go to people who really do. Well, remember that you're going to be paying taxes as well as receiving the basic income. And uh, you're probably going to pay uh, depending on what your income is, you're probably going to be a net contributor to the program. So, uh, so uh, you're, it's really no expense. Mo most of that expense is uh, most of that expense is is just you raise somebody's taxes uh, by the twelve thousand dollars, and then you give them the twelve thousand dollars. That doesn't cost you anything. For the government to take a dollar from you and give it right back is not an expense to you. There's a tiny transaction cost, but that's very small. It does not cost twelve thousand dollars for for you to get a basic income paid for by your own twelve thousand dollars in taxes. So that the tax, the actual expense, is a uh, is a tiny fraction of taking twelve thousand dollars and multiplying it, multiplying it by the adult population. I've done some calculations on this, and. Uh, at the $12,000 level, if you have a marginal tax rate of, of about uh, 50%, which is a lot lower than uh, people on benefits currently receive, then the actual net cost is, uh, the net redistributive cost, what you're redistributing from the haves to the have-nots, is about $700 billion a year, which is about 4% of our GDP. So it's nothing outrageous, and we we spend more than that on ridiculous things like corporate giveaways and, uh, and a military budget. So Brian, surely that's the point that with a basic income, work could be different. It would free people up to perhaps pursue a passion or something more creative, rather than relying on an income that's not of their choosing. Yeah, I mean, I think it's very likely. There's a big, re there's a simple reason why most people work for others, which is most people are not good at running a business. 
And it's scary to run a business. It's stressful to run a business. You know, there are you know, all, you know, people start businesses all sorts of times, but most of the time it fails because they're not good at doing it. And also a lot of people, even when they're running a successful business, and this is the pits. It's so stressful. You know, I mean, honestly, I am so grateful that everyone runs a business because I would never want to. I don't care how much money I have. I don't want to have to worry about that stuff. Like, I don't, I don't want to have to deal with employees. I don't want to have to deal with all these problems. And I'm happy that there's other people who are willing to do it who wind up producing almost all the wealth we have in the world. But aren't we missing out on those people who are willing to do that work, perhaps because they have to take another job? Right. Again, so if you really want to do this, uh, you know, people who actually are entrepreneurial standardly go and work an enormous number of hours in order to make it happen. Uh, like, you know, the, uh, the odds that there's someone right now who is not an entrepreneur just because they're, they're busy working for someone else, again, like there's obviously a few people like that, but again, I don't see that as really being a very large number of people. Right? And, and again, so if, if that's sort of your attitude of, well, I can't become an entrepreneur because I'm too busy with my job, you're, you're probably not an entrepreneur. That's not an entrepreneurial attitude. An entrepreneur is a can-do attitude and says, look, I'm going to figure out how to do this. I'm going to make this happen. may not be easy, but I will. Okay, well, now it's time to take some questions from our viewers. And we start with this one from Jason Williamson, who says, if I'm going to hire someone at $50,000, but there's a UBI, a basic income, that gives people $10,000 a year, then I have to offer only $40,000. So wouldn't a UBI put downward pressure on wages, thus nullifying any positive economic effects? So Carl Widerquist, I guess that's for you. Okay, well, uh, that, is, that is, I think, a, a realistic worry only if you have a very low basic income. Where no one can work on, where where no one can live on, then I think that's at least possible. Oh, although in Alaska, where they have a small basic income, where uh, people can't live on, it doesn't seem to be having an effect in depressing wages. I don't think it's very likely that uh, if people have a basic income that they could live on, that um, they will just accept. Well, then my my employer will cut my wages, and I'm going to work just as hard. I think. What you will what you will find is employers have to pay more in order to in order to get people to work. Depending on the range, at uh, at lower wages, this will have a much bigger effect. At higher wages, if you're making a hundred thousand dollars a year, I don't think uh, a twelve thousand dollar a year job is going to be very a uh, twelve thousand dollars a year without working is going to be is going to tempt a whole lot of people to make that cut. Um, and uh, but. At lower levels, it will, and that gives employers the incentive that we need, the incentive for, to get them to pay better wages. And the thing that is that has really been act, acted, you know, the the uh, Brian there talked about how much she loves entrepreneurs and wouldn't like to be one, doesn't want to handle stuff. That's fine, but I'm not in freedom of choice. I don't believe forcing people to work for entrepreneurs is good. If entrepreneurs want people to work, they should. They should offer wages where a non-starving person will, in fact, agree to work for those wages. And that's when you know it's a good wage, when a free person shows. Not when a person who's been forced into deprivation by non-contractual obligations will do it. You know, anything you can get people to work for extremely low wages if you do those sort of things. Okay, and our second question comes from Laura Freeman who asks, suppose there's a UBI at $20,000. Now imagine that 10 people decide to live together and pool their UBIs and not one of them has to work. Can 10 people live on $200,000? Maybe, maybe not. But regardless, there's a point at which enough people can pool their UBIs without any of them having to work. So wouldn't this increase unemployment is the question, which I guess is skeptical. Brian Kaplan, I'm sure you would agree Right, so it's, it's going to reduce what, we, what economists call labor force participation. It means that there's less, less and less of a reason to work. So yeah, I think that's, that's, that's very likely. Uh, so, and again, what's striking is at least some UBI advocates say it doesn't kick in until you turn 21 years old, precisely because they're worried about teenagers uh, and young people doing stuff like this. Uh, you know, so I would say this is just part and parcel of the more general problem that uh, you are encouraging people to not work. And then the other side, of course, is that the extra taxes that are required to pay for this discourage people from work, well, discourage all the other people from working as well. So you have to look at it from both sides of the disincentives, the disincentives of the people who are getting the money who say, hey, I don't need to work. 
And the disincentives of the people who are supporting those people saying the taxes rate this high, the taxes this high, I don't feel like doing it either. Maybe I'll switch teams. Okay, and Carl Weiderquist, given that Laura Freeman's question was skeptical of a universal basic income, what about this issue then of pulling it and not having to work? Yeah, I, I, I would encourage people to do that. We, um, uh, I, I don't know, $20,000 might be more than we can afford, maybe fifteen. No one wants uh, a base, no one in the basic income movement wants a basic income higher than what we can sustain. Uh, what's the highest sustainable basic income, which I'm convinced is higher than the official poverty level. Okay, and now it's time for Answer This, where each guest asks a question directly to the other. So, Brian Kaplan, would you like to go first? Yes. Uh, so, in the modern world, it seems that the main predictor of your income is actually just what country you happen to be born in. So, what I'm wondering for Carl is, does the universal basic income apply to foreigners? And if not, why not? Well, we're stuck with a nation state system for now. I don't really like the nation state system, but uh, the only way you could get rid of it would be, at this point in time, would be to uh, send tanks and guns and planes across borders and kill a bunch of people and force your will on them. And I'm against that. Money, so just some the checks. different nation states are going to have different policies uh, for various times. I would, I would. I would love for some time to come. I'd love to see a, a worldwide basic income. That would be a great thing. But uh, I think the way we're most likely to get it is for nations to, one at a time, start doing it. And uh, when people see how well it works and how much better it is not to live in a world where uh, those of us who work for a living are in this constant fear of never, of uh, that someday we might be poor, that I think uh, it will spread around around the world. Okay, Carl, and just to elaborate on Brian Kaplan's point then, myself as someone from overseas, I arrive in America, should I get my $12,000 straight away? Uh, well, no, and I, I'm, there needs to be some sort of a happy medium because, uh, because you, you know, people coming right here and instantly getting it seems a bit, seems a bit too fast because that might give a greater incentive. I, I am for I am for open borders, but uh, that's unlikely to happen uh, anytime soon. But it seems that it would give a very it would give a much greater incentive to uh, migrate than than we would need or want. However, if you make it so you're never eligible, then you could get it to the point where the citizens become a new elite class and all the real work is being done by immigrants. So there has to be some happy medium where if you're going to come to the country, you could be on your path towards full citizenship. And when you get full citizenship, after a reasonable amount of time, you're going to get all the rights of citizenship, including the basic income. OK, so perhaps for citizens only. So Carl Weidekos, what's your question for Brian Kaplan? OK, well, I'd like to try a thought experiment. Now, there's all these tech entrepreneurs who uh, believe that uh, we're pretty much not going to need most jobs, most working class jobs. You know, we, we're looking at 10 million drivers losing their jobs with, uh, with uh, fully autonomous cars. And then we're lose, looking at a lot of the support personnel that support drivers losing their jobs. Let's just suppose it has happened. So we have, uh, we have uh, all these people with not enough resources to survive um, and no work that they can do. Um, should they and they just uh, become permanent charity wards? Should they think, oh well, the resources of the earth belong to other people? I should just starve or get charity? Or do they really have some sort of right to exist, a right to access the resources of the earth so they can continue to live? Or, or is actually their very survival uh, depend on the whims of the resource-owning class? Uh, so, you know, in your extreme scenario, which uh, I agree with you is uh, actually highly unlikely, uh, what I would say oh, is you know, even the like said, you've got a fixed amount of charity, you should focus the charity on the people who actually need it. There are plenty of people who foresee this world coming and will actually take care of themselves by working now in order to get some resources. So again, why waste money on those people? So again, whatever, so whatever charity you're going to be spending, you should target it based upon First of all, actual need, and second of all, whether or not you behave responsibly and uh, under the conditions. So even then, I don't see any appeal for the universal basic income. 
Of course, in this world you're describing, people would be so phenomenally rich, you wouldn't need very much charity in order to give people a decent, in order to give people a decent life anyway. So I'm, I'm, I'm very much rooting for this world to happen. All right, and now it's time for We Agree, where each guest names something the other said that he agrees with. So, Brian Kaplan, what did Carl Weirequist convince you of? Well, I already agree with him on open borders. So the idea oh. that anyone on Earth should be able to work in any country that they want, that anyone should be able to take a job anywhere, seems to me to be both morally and economically a great idea. Um, you know, although, I mean, when, again, when I think about that, you know, I would say that I think that if we want to kill any possibility of this ever happening, a universal basic income is a great way to do it. Because the last thing people are going to want is to let immigrants come in if they know that they're immediately entitled to be supported by taxpayers. I mean, I also say that you know, when I see people coming legally or illegally to work to other countries, I mean, this is what shows how wrong Carl's whole view of the world is. The wages for even low-skilled workers in the first world are actually fantastically high. It is not impossible or even all that difficult for people to work their way up. And really, there, you know, there is something very embarrassing for someone who's born in a first world country who says, I can't figure out any way of taking care of myself. Uh, you know, when, when you go and see that someone can smuggle, you know, can smuggle themselves in from Mexico or Haiti and work their way up, and when I see that, I see what every per, every, every poor able-bodied person who's born in this country really should be doing is learning about proper work ethic and virtue from people who weren't even born in this country. So, Carl Weidequist, some agreement there, if not necessarily on the universal basic income. So, what did Brian Kaplan say that convinced you? I think we agreed that the government isn't very good at, uh, at determining who's truly needy. Uh, I think the disagreement that went along is, is that uh, uh, Brian Kaplan seems to think that private charities are very good at it. I think private charities are probably likely to be worse at it because they suffer from self-serving bias where um, private charities like, think, yes, the, the lower class should be satisfied with living in shacks and drinking water with lead in it. Um, and it's really their fault if, uh, if they don't get a better job. OK, so maybe not any agreement there, but that is all we have time for. I'd like to thank Brian Kaplan of George Mason University and Carl Weidequist of Georgetown University for joining us to discuss this issue. Thank you. My pleasure. And thank you for watching Scholars Mate. I'm Adam Beer. We'll see you next time.